if I sit there by myself recording videos, I'm like, but, 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 especially right. medical jargon, it's horrible. Yeah. So yeah. write me a nootropic stack for verbal <laughs> fluency, please. <laughs> well, you, you have a couple, well, you have at least one powerful ingredient as a star and that's you. Vigorous podcast with Vigor Steve and Ryan Michael Ballo from Cortex Labs. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I've been following your content for a while, and I saw that you posted a very cool video about um, even Steve knows that choline over uh, consumption is not a good thing. <laughs> so I yep. figured I'd reach out to you and see if we could do a collaboration. And, cool. and before we get started, on behalf on behalf of all the anabolic androgenic steroid users worldwide. Welcome to the club. Oh yeah, me. Yeah, I've I thought you were talking to them. Yeah, dude, busy. I am. You know, no, no, it's really is, you. is a steroid. I love it, man. Honestly, uh, you know, right. yeah. For those of you that don't know what Steve's talking about, I just jumped into TRT two months ago. I've been fussing with a bunch of stuff for many years to try to you know raise my testosterone and keep it at adequate levels. But the TRT is a, definitely a different animal. I've been studying it for a while and working with guys on TRT, but like you know, when you're injecting it yourself, it's different. Two months in, so far, <laughs> I love it and I'm, I'm feeling good. And, you know, my numbers seem to be dialed in in the right place. I just had some labs. So we'll see how it works out. Cool. So what, what, is your, what is your current TRT protocol? And is it going to stay TRT or are you going to go to HRT and then TRT plus and like the rest um, of us, you know, we all just start dabbling with more stuff. Well, I don't know. I like to dabble, right? So like it's it's probably going to stay TRT for the foreseeable future. Um, right now I'm at 140 mm -hmm. milligrams a week. I'm injecting every fourth day. Okay. So I guess I'm injecting was at 70 milligrams a week every fourth day. Uh, I'm inject, you know, mm -hmm. I started injecting it essentially this, this idea of shallow IM, shallow intramuscular. And maybe we can talk mm -hmm. about that because I have my skepticism about that. Um, and yeah, yeah definitely, definitely noticeable. Um, so like, you know, and my labs reflect that it, it is, you know, raising serum test concentrations significantly. Um, right. not Are you using the, the insulin needles, right? Yeah. Like a small slim pin. Yeah. hundred unit, uh, insulin needle. Yeah. So that it's been interesting, relatively painless. Sure. It doesn't feel like an intramuscular shot, right? It's essentially sub Q. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm hitting the muscle. It's, it's difficult to say. And again, that's a topic we should discuss, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, so far so good. 140 milligrams a week. All right. Awesome. Awesome. And, and nothing else. So no aromatized inhibitor, no HCG, no DHA and pregnenolone. Not yet. Um, estradiol okay. was, and this was not the sensitive estradiol was at 35 mm -hmm. picograms per milliliter when I just tested it. So that's okay. I don't have any weird symptoms, no itchy nipples, no like crying during movies, <laughs> none of that stuff. So, you know, so I, I feel yeah. good. I honestly feel good. I can awesome. tell, like, I can tell like the neurotransmitter element of it is mm -hmm. working, you know, like the catecholamine right. and dopamine release. I absolutely feel the energy. It's, it's pretty wild. Yeah, it's it's usually different. Like we're we're the same age, or so you're 39, I'm 39, and I, oh, yeah, of course, I'm a bodybuilder, so I, I started you know dabbling with with steroids when I was 26, so it's way earlier than you. But I do yeah. notice when I run like a conservative dose of TRT that you know for entrepreneurship and pro productivity, it's it's very beneficial. Right? That's why yeah. a lot of guys nowadays on an entrepreneur stack, which is what something we should discuss is that there's always a little bit of testosterone in the picture because your levels are more stable, you feel more uh, motivated, right? Your dopamine system is a little bit stimulated and, and the neurotransmitters, like you mentioned. And in many yeah. cases, the sleep quality is also highly improved. Now, of course, some guys get, you know, some, some issues with that. So I, I recently made a video about that. So if anybody suffers from sleep issues on TRT, give that video a watch. And, you know, my recommendation to you would be just to stick to sub Q because I've done intramuscular shots for over a decade uh -huh. and that scar tissue builds up. Yeah. It, it's not nice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of the common, you know, drawbacks or pitfalls or whatever, right? Negatives right. to it is, is this buildup of scar tissue. Um, you know, I have, so I fuss with it a bunch of different things so far since I started, I started off essentially doing this kind of shallow I am thing. And then, you know, there were a couple injections that were just straight subcutaneous and, you know, injecting 70 milligrams at a time subcutaneous is a little weird, right? I mean, I had one kind of like, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, like, you could just see fat, the oil. It's like a fat, fat, fat bubble. Yeah. So yeah, you could see the oil. I know it's not pleasant. Well, it's so cool. what I what I what I do is like in the upper glute area. That's like the last place people would see it, right? 
So yeah. if you go out to the beach or you go to the gym, you use the locker room, then of course your underwear is still on. So nobody would see it there. So bodybuilders right. would inject either in their glutes or if you do subcutaneous, you just reach back there and pin it in the fat. And usually men have the most fat on their glutes. So even if you inject there like twice a week or a couple times a week, then there are those, you know, those fatty marbles, those oily marbles, they're not very visible. Mm -hmm. So my yeah. recommendation would to put it there, just keep in mind that your serum concentrations might dip a little bit because, you know, the, the testosterone leaves that injection depot a little bit slower compared to the intramuscular because that has more right. blood flow, more enzymes right. to break down the fat. Yeah. Right. But all in all, I would say that the results, the results are pretty much the same. Yeah, that's what you've seen. That was, a, you know, that was a topic of discussion I wanted to bring up. So I guess we should just jump into that. Um, yeah. So first of all, um, let me get done my questions I had for you. Um, where the hell was that? Okay, so like subcutaneous injection, right? Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, like you said, the muscle is not dispersing the the material uh, or the muscle would be dispersing the material in, in more of a rapid way than if it's sitting right. in subcutaneous tissue um and this whole idea of sub q makes it so that you know you, you ultimately have more consistent levels so that the levels once they reach where they're reaching based on your dose they're the same mm -hmm. yeah. for a considerable period of time thereafter it, it, what happens if if somebody so you know say somebody starts sub q levels are pretty much the same, but their estradiol is at, you know, 40 or 50 picograms per milliliter, and that's messing with their libido or something. Like, mm. is that a reason to, you know, go on an estradiol and try to, you know, reduce some of that testosterone conversion to estradiol? Or is there a, a frequency change that should take place? You know, in your opinion, how does one go around the fact that sub Q is good? Yes, but then you get these consistent levels. What if those levels aren't, aren't right for you? So, you know, you can address it in a multitude of different ways. So the, the easiest way is basically increasing your injection frequency. So if you're doing twice a week, you go to every day or every other day. Um, it can be a little bit cumbersome, of course, but, you know, when you're just starting with TRT, those injections are usually a little bit of a roadblock. You're sitting yeah. there pacing and like, oh, this little needle is going to go inside my body. And ooh. But after a couple of weeks or months, you get used to that stuff. And if, when you start doing it every day, it, it's kind of the same as brushing your teeth, you know, just right. something you have to do every day, a couple times a day. Yeah. Okay. You have one right. injection per day. You do it sub Q. The injection volume is literally, you know, a drop of, of liquid. So you, it's almost unnoticeable. And, mm -hmm. you know, that way you can control the conversion and the serum concentrations even more. So the guys yeah. that do daily subcutaneous micro administrations, they usually have the most stable levels, stable testosterone, stable estradiol, stable dihydrotestosterone. And if that doesn't work, right, they aromatize a lot, they can reduce their body fat levels or, mm. you know, simply by performing a diet, right? You cut your calories yeah. down a little bit. The testosterone will keep your metabolic rate going because now you're, you know, relying on super physiological or at least higher than you had before levels. And, yep. you know, and otherwise sometimes guys are micronutrient deficient. So zinc, for example, acts as a yep. little bit of an aromatized inhibitor. So maybe 50 right. milligrams of zinc on top of your diet. Usually most guys get like 15 milligrams. So you supplement 50 to hundred maybe on top. And, and even a nootropic like nicotine has been shown to, uh, and of course we go to, with the nicotine patches or the nicotine gum, not the cigarettes. It's a little bit old news. <laughs> <laughs> so even nicotine has been shown to inhibit uh, conversion of testosterone into estradiol. So there's so many things you can hmm. explore. Didn't know that. And then, you know, and then later on, if you want, okay, you, you know, if you want an aromatized inhibitor for injection frequency convenience, I want to stick with twice a week. I don't want to lose my body fat. I don't want right. to supplement with nicotine. <laughs> then, okay, yeah. use an aromatized inhibitor and then you'll use the lowest dose that you can get away with, you know, and right. for that you, need, you need to do blood work, obviously. Yeah, you know, definitely. So, so you do you do your blood work frequently, right? And, and for you, yeah. in, in your case, with two administrations per week, you're totally fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, things are looking pretty good right now. I mean, if, if there are modifications that need to take place, I mean, there's all manner of things you can do. Um, but, it, you know, if, if worst case scenario, I've got to bring an astrozole and definitely I'm going to low dose it because you know, I've worked with guys on TRT and trying to help them manage their protocols mm -hmm. for a while, um, even though I wasn't on TRT, which is interesting. I learned a lot about it. The one thing I have seen for sure is, you know, when, when, when guys take the recommendations of their doc, and I'm not suggesting you mm -hmm. don't listen to the doctor, 
second, but there's sort of a broad brush common recommendation to dose. They have, they have it's cookie cutter protocols. Right? Yeah. yeah, they crash <laughs> totally. They, they crash their estrogen. And, you know, I've got guys that are like, well, you know, we, we look at their labs and their E2 is at like four or something. And, and oh. no wonder they feel like shit and they're depressed yeah. and their joints hurt and all these things. So, yeah, yeah definitely, um, definitely something to, to tread carefully around. But, you know, if, if it gets to that level where I feel like E2 is a problem, then, uh, you know, then maybe I'll start eating broccoli and cruciferous vegetables. But probably yeah, right. You're going to dynomethane, yeah. right? Dynomethane supplementation. Yeah, to dim, yeah. Estradiol into estrone, right? So, so there's so many ways to look at it. And, and otherwise, okay, you know, it sounds counterproductive or, or for the guys that experience hair loss, but if you add a DHT derivative like Primabol and Masterone, uh, Provirin even, if you add that on top, that inhibits some of the estrogen conversion as well. So now really? you have a little I bit Really? I didn't more, know that. Yeah, yeah. So you have this aromatized enzyme when testosterone goes in there, a part of that converts into nandrolone as an intermediary. So that's why nandrolone is an endogenous hormone, but it's just trace amounts that isn't even a reference range. And then it converts into estradiol. So wow. if you have uh, primabolin or mastrone or other DHT derivatives in the picture, they actually go into the aromatase enzyme and stick in there, similar to an astrozole, similar to aromatase. Wow. Right? They go in the aromatase enzyme and temporarily block the conversion of testosterone into estradiol. And then that's they also cool. have some estrogen inhibiting effects at the receptor site. So, you know, for most guys that, that go on testosterone, they don't want to use an aromatized inhibitor, even though I don't think that aromatized inhibitors are the devil. Um, you know, yeah, if they're overused, of course, when you look at the literature, it's always all, all these terrible side effects of aromatized inhibitors all related to low estrogen, not the aromatized right. inhibitor itself, because it's right, prescribed definitely. to breast cancer, right? Breast cancer scenarios. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, there's like there's there's people that have made an entire living or an entire YouTube presence on the notion of like saying, "Hey, estrogen is great." So like you know, there, there's different mm -hmm. camps, and, and people demonize it, and then there are yeah. other people that are like, "You should let it go as high as possible." You know, um, it, it's what seems clear is that mm -hmm. it shouldn't be substantially low. And if you no. were to look at both sides of the spectrum, like you'd probably rather have it in a in a somewhat higher range than crashed for yeah. sure. Well, yeah, if, if your testosterone is high, then your estrogen, you know, as a matter of balance should be a little bit higher as well. But right. the higher it gets, the more you risk gynecomastia or acne or, or water retention, you know, and then you have to yeah. patch that with other issues. And, and gyno surgery is pricey, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> Dude, you know, like, like hair, yeah, hair loss and gyno surgery, you know, if you want to do plugs or anything like that or transplants, it, it's, yeah, yeah. it's going to cost you a lot of money. So, you know, mitigation of that. A TRT is never as simple as just pinning tests. It's always you know, right. extra stuff that comes along with it. But I, I think, you know, as long as you do your blood work and you just manage it every couple of months, every month, ideally, until you hit your sweet spot, then you're good, you know? Yeah. And then, and then if, if you're not in the sweet spot, there's so many options, um, then it's up to you which option you want to go with, you know? So, yeah, but I, I think for overall productivity, TRT is great. Like, I'm off TRT now because I'm trying to get my wife pregnant. And mm. I, I noticed already that the motivation and the, um, you know, the drive, the aggression, the positive aggression, that's already less. So mm -hmm. kind of sucks. Yeah, immediately, yeah. right? It's yeah. like the, the corresponding yeah. increase in uh, epinephrine, neuroepinephrine, mm. dopamine, epinephrine is is probably low. It's, it seems as like that increase uh, may stay there for a period, two or three days. I don't believe it stays there very long, right? But then once, no. you know, there's nothing else forcing that catecholamine synthesis or production, then mm -hmm. you're you're left with. That's why you see a lot of guys that are like, you know, they were on 180 milligrams or something, a test. They were functioning fine and felt great, but, you know, they're sitting at, I don't know, 1,200 total tests and, mm -hmm. you know, their free test is above the reference range. And then doc goes, hey, let's, we got to lower this because, you know, they're being conservative and whatever. Um, and then they do and guys end up feeling crappy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's mostly the neurotransmitters. You know, if yeah. you're, if you've been, it's basically like driving a car. So if you've been driving your Ferrari at like a hundred miles an hour for months and you go to 60, it's really slow. You're yeah. still in the Ferrari though. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know? But yeah. you're like, Oh man, it's, I'm not getting anywhere. You know, everybody's speeding right. past me. So that's exactly that's how it hilarious. feels. Yeah. Totally. yeah. And, and, um, and, and the good, the good thing is we have nootropics for that to kind of, you know, if you come off, you have no nootropics to kind of raise the dopaminergic signaling and neurotransmitters totally. yeah so that's that's why i usually tell people when they do post-cycle therapy to you know look into l-dopa 
And I believe you have a couple of good recommendations for that. So feel free to jump in here. Like what would be your suggestions to increase dopamine and, and noradrenaline or norepinephrine levels um, when you're drug free or coming off? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, I think the f- you probably shoot for the low hanging fruit for something like that. And the first option mm-hmm. would be a compound called L-tyrosine. Tyrosine. Yeah. I'm sure you've heard mm-hmm. of tyrosine. The tyrosine yeah. is basically like a straight shot to converting to dopamine. It's going to synthesize from, uh, what is it, tyrosine hydroxylase and dopa, mm-hmm. dopa decarboxylase to dopamine. And then you're going to convert some of that tyrosine to norepinephrine right away. And I forget the name of the enzyme there, but that, it's a pretty straight shot. I mean, tyrosine is effectively a precursor to those neurotransmitters. So mm, 300 to 600 milligrams L-tyrosine daily in that case would be a good standalone option. Uh, increasing the catecholamines as a whole, well, let's just talk about dopamine, right? I mean, I think that's a yeah. big part of it. There's a number of things you can do. Um, you can upregulate or foster the further expression of the enzymes that are converting your tyrosine from your diet into mm. dopamine and you can do that with a compound called bromantane. Have you heard of bromantane? Do you know what that is? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I've, I've tried a sample from a friend of mine, but I never had a oh, yeah? full opportunity to to run it for. Yeah, it's a difficult source, it seems, or at least the, the yeah. sources that I have. So, yeah, I mean, there's. You may look into nootropicsource.com. That's the last time mm-hmm. that I purchased bromantane, and they they have it. But it, it's yeah, it's otherwise it is hard to source. Um, yeah. It, it basically upregulates the expression of the conversion enzymes that take your tyrosine and turn it into dopamine. So, so just taking like 30 to 50 milligrams of bromantane will help a lot of guys synthesize more dopamine as a result. Oh, right. But then, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in addition to that, I mean, there are a lot of compounds that f- work to, aside from their main mechanism of action, foster catecholamine release. Um, one of them is a chemical called teacrine. Teacrine. It's, oh, uh, right. yeah. it's, a, yeah. it's a methyl xanthine. So it's a caffeine analog and it will make you release more dopamine. So like aside from the kind of caffeine energy that you get from it, like you should also like get that kind of motivated energy. So those are a couple options. And then there's, dude, I mean, the list of nootropics that affect dopamine is pretty, <laughs> pretty vast. So yeah. there's things like uridine, which I think I remember you recently talking about. Yeah. Um, I really like that will, one. I think I think I watched one of your videos like ages ago and like, okay, this sounds good. I got to try this. So I yeah. bought a bottle and then you bought another bottle and another bottle and another, right? Because it, it really works like 300 milligrams or something, you know, it's like before, um, you know, cognitive demanding jobs, like recording videos, yeah. for example, or research. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really beneficial. And I, I took that for a long time, just solo. And then I, yeah. you know, I you know, through my sponsorship, Gorilla Mind, they, they started adding it into the respawn. And yeah, I think it's it's one of the greatest. Like with nootropics, usually you buy a bottle, and then when your bottle finished, you're like, hmm, should I buy another one? Like I've, I've right. tried so many, you know, like Dihexa, yeah. for example. Yeah, you yeah. Buy a bottle, huh. okay, ten milligrams feels good. You can try it a couple times, okay, maybe not so good. You try it every day, then it starts right. feeling like drugs. Oh, yeah, man. definitely. <laughs> it starts feeling yeah. So, you, so now I have like half a bottle of Dihexa sitting here in my cabinet. I'm like. I'd rather take my uridine monophosphate. <laughs> totally. I mean, uridine is so stable as a nootropic. It's insane. It's doing a lot. Some of it's converting to CDP choline. It's giving you more brain choline. Uh, it's supposed to be sensitizing dopamine receptors, which kind of just potentiates the effect of your your natural dopamine. But then also, if you if you combine it with choline and B vitamins and and DHA, one of the one of the omega three fatty acids. Those are literally the ingredients you need to spawn new neurons to 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 engage in this process called neurogenesis. So it's like iridine is doing all kinds of stuff, right? You know, and when you know it, it's it is it is one of the most prominently noticeable nootropics in that, like you yeah. said, like you're, you're not going to take and be like, am I am I noticing this? Definitely going to notice it. Yeah. Yeah, you'll definitely notice it. Yeah, and then suddenly three hours has passed. You're like, oh, I did so much work. Should I yeah, take another totally. dose? But I, I, yeah, but I do feel like the second dose is not as clean as the first yep. dose. Yep, you sure. Know, like this, I so, mean, so I, I just limit it to one serving per day, or or maybe four yep. or five times a week. You know, when there's demanding yep. jobs to do. But yeah, that's one of the the more the one that I like more. And I think I, I saw it on one of your videos uh, ages ago. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't taken uridine for a while, and yeah, that happens. I mean, it's like. Never is the second dose of a nootropic in a given day 
as mm-hmm. clean as the first one. I think there's a lot that goes into that. I mean, nootropics, you're, you're almost constantly chasing like uh, or preventing brain homeostasis from kicking in and then mm-hmm. reducing the amount of neurotransmitters that you just like optimize, right? So right. the second doses in the day are always going to be less, you know, kind of subjectively noticeable for that reason. And then also like you're more tired, you've expended a lot of energy, used your brain and whatever. You don't have that like morning energy. So it's, it's different. Right. Yeah. I feel, I feel that you'd like, even, even, you know, when you are on a full blown entrepreneur stack, you know, with all kinds of nootropics and TRT, there's only so many productive hours in the day for yeah. like real cognitive, um, you know, inspiration to really do yeah. solid work. And then I, yeah. you kind of push the routine jobs later in the day that you can get away with caffeine or something like that, or maybe yep. the modafinil is still working or the paracetam, you know, is right. still acting up. I know those are longer lasting. So yeah. like if you have like four or five hours of real creativity, and then later in the day, you know, if you space it out correctly, you just do your routine stuff, you know, because we all right. have to do that or accounting and, you know, YouTube back end uh, <laughs> management, right? Mm-hmm. So yep. yeah, if you structure it like that, I think I think you can accomplish a lot, you know, in those first couple of hours of the day that you do something like uranium monophosphate, it's highly beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, definitely. That, that's the, that's the routine you know most people should be on if they're using nootropics. Like, you know, a stack that affects them positively in the morning. You know, somewhere around the administration of their caffeine, so they have that kind of aiding in the energy component of it. Banging out as much work as possible while you have the kind of cognitive reservoir, and then maybe breaking and doing dinner, whatever you do in between. And then I think the second use case for nootropics later in the day is different compounds than your initial stack you took in the morning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're really only looking for an advancement of your, like an enhancement of your baseline at the time. You're not looking to get that really substantially powerful nootropic effect later on the day because it may disrupt your sleep and whatever, overstimulate you or something. But, but, you know, like just if you, low dose the right nootropics uh, again things like teacrine you, you could use racetams in the evening kind of low medium dose them then you just you enliven your brain function a noticeable degree but you're not overstimulated you run way less of a risk for side effects in the evening and then you can you know cal- you know get two three hours more of productivity right Right. Did you, did you ever use like carnitine, like injectable carnitine, acetyl L carnitine, carnitine yes. L tartrate as a little bit of a cognitive boosting, you know, to totally. absorb the, the fat? And, yeah. So I found that it's very beneficial, but it's non stimulating. So if you take like for a you. second dose of carnitine, yeah, for me, I, uh, you know, I don't find it yeah. stimulating. I find that it kind of opens up the brain for a couple mm-hmm. hours and I'm always in ketosis. So that helps with cognitive, ah. you know, uh, the functioning quite a bit. So I'm always in ketosis totally. for the last. And 20 years, maybe even longer. Wow. And, wow. and then, I, yeah, I take carnitine. Yeah. And then, you know, you feel like a little bit of two or three hours, you feel a little bit of like a, a brain opening, like almost lim- limitless, but not the, to that extent. The NTT, yeah. what was that drug? NTT. Yeah, yeah Bradley Cooper movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah NTT yeah, exactly, drug yeah. from the dude's yeah. like ex-girlfriend's like brother or something. Like what a right. shady deal. <laughs> Great movie. Oh, that's how it's, yeah, a girlfriend movie. So... So I, I like that like a little bit later in the day. And usually I, I take my carnitine before the workout because it helps with a little bit of fat loss. But I, I yeah. the effect of carnitine is longer lasting. So I do notice, like I just came from the gym and uh, before we do this podcast, but I do feel that the nootropic benefits of the injectable carnitine is still wow. there. Now, wow. injectable so how, carnitine what? is a much higher bioavailability yeah. than oral L-carnitine. I imagine. So, what I mean, what is your dose? Like, how does that translate to like, because I take the acetylated version that's acetyl Mm l-carnitine or alcar yeah it's totally in the classification of nootropics this stuff is very powerful um Mm -hmm. but you know my dose is like 300 400 milligrams and yeah for like two to four hours noticeable energy Mm -hmm. kind of a stimulant effect but my brain is working better so it turns out the stuff makes you yield more acetylcholine that's like a focus neurotransmitter but given that dose like what what is your administ you know your administration of carnitine know injectable administration what how does that so translate it's, it's higher it's it's 500 milligrams injectable l-carnitine sub q wow. and keep in mind guys for the guys that's never used injectable l-carnitine this is not acetyl l-carnitine or l-carnitine l-tartrate this is pure l-carnitine because uh, you know the bioavailability issues that you see with oral uh, carnitine are not there because you're injecting it that also means that it's quite painful 
it feels like you're injecting gonorrhea. It burns. It's not, it's not nice. Yeah, it's not nice. It lasts for about two minutes and you get used to it. Um, but still, you know, for the guys that want to try it, oh, it sounds like a good idea. Uh, yeah, get ready. You can't walk away from it. It will follow you, this burning sensation. Yeah, <laughs> so be warned. Keep it in mind. Yeah, be warned. Yeah. But That's bioavailability is 100%, whereas the bioavailability of carnitine orally is, is only a couple right. percent. Mm -hmm. Right, and then you have the risk that it, it contributes to TMA formation, uh, resulting in TMAO. Right. right, and that's you know not very good for your cardiovascular system. Um, yep. and, and you know, guys, if you're worried about that, allicin, right, um, garlic extract, which your carnitine helps to inhibit that, and otherwise, uh, you know, a cycle of doxycycline, which will kill all the bacteria that produce TMA in the intestinal tract. Of course, you need yep. to repopulate your gut microbiome after that, but uh, yeah. just the long hanging fruit to kind of get rid of these. Uh, issues um but yeah it's, it's such a big difference so even if you inject maybe 250 milligrams that would kind of translate to you taking 2000 to 3000 milligrams of oral Jesus. carnitine yeah right. it's a huge yeah. difference yeah yeah so that's why i always you take it and then maybe 30 minutes later it goes systemic and oh, it yeah. ends up in your brain and then all yeah. the ketones and the the triglycerides and you know they all get absorbed and then yeah, the like, mitochondrial Ooh. optimization. That now that yeah. makes total sense, man. I mean that that so like if I think of the days, the early days of my nootropics usage when I was a young yeah. pioneer, I uh, yeah. I definitely dosed a lot of the like a lot of everything at higher doses, mm. and I think the highest I've ever gone on Alcar was like a gram, and that was very powerful. So I yeah. <laughs> I couldn't imagine you know L carnitine injectable. It's something I'll put on my list to look into for sure. Yeah, because when, when I sometimes I watch your videos and you're quite conservative with some of your doses, then I see in the comment section, yep. like, why why only 300 to 600 milligrams of L-tyrosine when everybody doses like 2,000? <laughs> but I think you're like much more optimized than a lot yeah. of these guys that are getting started. So definitely. I mean, you offer courses for that on your website, obviously. Um, and, and yeah, there's a couple courses that are nootropic centered. Yeah, I mean, but mm -hmm. and and they're good for generally learning how to use nootropics, which nootropics to take at which doses, how to use nootropics in targeted ways to induce certain states. But right. you know, mm -hmm. on the channel, on the Cortex Labs channel, there's like 1,300 videos of very very nuanced oh, wow. stuff. I mean. You always look at your newer stuff and you're like, oh, it's so much better because you evolve over the years and you look at your older shit and you're like, ah, you know, you cringe over that stuff. I know. So watch within the last, you know, year even. And there's tons uh, of good content. on that. Yeah. But you have to leave those old videos online because they're in the algorithm and they will continue right. to, you know, produce new subscribers. So that's yeah. why I always leave them up. And then if I, I make a video that is same topic, but like new information or better produced, then I just link it down below and say, hey, don't watch this video, watch this one instead. You know? So yeah, you keep that's a good idea. I got to do that on some of my old cringy videos. <laughs> <laughs> I have them too. Actually, I deleted like a hundred videos of the early ones. They were so cringy. Oh, I was, man. I was like, a, a dude, I was 120 kilos, like a huge bodybuilder. And yeah. I didn't know about sound editing. So all the breathing and stuff, like the, right. the snor snoring while you're awake. <laughs> <Yeah>. like, <sighs> dude, was, so, so many so things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, crappy mics and the, the whole nine yards. Yeah, I, I suffer yeah, with that yeah. every day. But you're right. I mean, the algorithm sort of necessitates them staying, you know, some of those videos right. staying there. And, just and keep you know, if people yeah. are people are willing to look past like the audio, you know, being crappy or whatever, then um, there's, there's good information. And I'm sure in your old stuff and as mine as well. Yeah. If they subscribe for, for, for those videos, then I'm sure they'll love the new stuff even more, you know, because the production is yeah. so much better. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> so much better. All right. So did you ever experiment with these compounds that increase neurogenesis? So you just mentioned neurogenesis from the uridine monophosphate, but I, yep. I think you have a video about Sumax mm -hmm. and no, did you ever experiment with dihexa or cerebral mm -hmm. lysin or uh, cerebral lysin? Yeah, uh, SRIs, no. Cerebral lysin is the, the only one of the kind of neurogenesis agents that I haven't fussed with. Dihexa, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, uridine, yes. Anything that's going to uh, even be close to neurogenesis, like uh, Bacopa, mm -hmm. which uh, basically extends the branches between neurons, axons, and dendrites, mm -hmm. and makes them literally grow. Uh, highly effective stuff, new pept, another nootropic compound that will express more nerve growth factor, which mm -hmm. will be reparative, but is sort of pushing toward that end of neurogenesis. Mm -hmm. I've experimented with all of it, honestly. And there's a lot of things that I notice about the way that my brain functions now and in the last nine years or so that I did mm -hmm. not notice 20 years ago or even 15 years ago when I was younger. 
like reading comprehension is one good example of that. When I was young, like I remember in my, in my middle school, high school days, I was terrible at it. Like I could be reading a book and like, mm. I don't know. I mean, I go to the next page and be like, I don't even remember what I just read. And that's how I was. I couldn't, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't, consu- I couldn't remember it. So like, but after dosing nootropics and particularly some of these neurogenesis nootropics, mm. I read 10 page scientific journals. I read like big, long PDFs. Like, like yeah. I can consume yeah. information and remember it. So, yeah. you know, attributable to the daily usage or the mostly daily usage of nootropics, maybe attributable to the neurogenesis agents, yeah. probably. I think, and also over time, the longer you take these neuro, uh, neurotropic agents, I think the better your cognitive abilities get. You also get a little bit more calm, a little bit more composed in yeah. how you handle particular situations. That's what I noticed myself because I you know bodybuilders are a little bit of a hothead always and, you know, <laughs> quick to judge and react. And then after, you know, experimenting with Samax and Selank and Cerebral Lysin, and also I almost spent a whole year on fluvoxamine, which is very uh, neurogenic. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it was a very good experience for, for overall productivity and, uh, you know, memory retention and, and learning, um, mm. because with fluvoxamine, for example, you get like a little bit of a neurogenesis basically the whole day. Yeah. So that, that's an SSRI, is it not? Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Is that the only thing it's doing is just in inhibiting serotonin? No, no. So, so yeah, of course it's an SSRI, so it inhibits the serotonin uh, pathways, but as a result of that, uh, based on what I read in the studies, you get some neurogenesis uh, continuously because these these SSRIs are longer lasting. And when you compare all of the SSRIs, it seems that fluvoxamine uh, potentiates the most neurogenesis is one of the reasons why they uh, probably prescribe that for COVID long hauler syndrome, right? Mm-hmm. Where you mm-hmm. definitely need some mm-hmm. neurogenesis because it right. just affects you systemically. And there's yeah. another compound called vuroxetine, which is, you know, when you go to Reddit, all these extreme biohackers, they actually pr- prefer that, which is also an SSRI. Vortio, right. Vortio succeed. Zetine, man, it's impossible to pronounce. So, yeah, <laughs> fluvoxamine is yeah, it's, fluvoxamine is kind of prescribed for uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, and mm. fortioxetine is um, used to treat major depressive disorder. Now, mm. I haven't done so much research on this compound, but I believe that you know the extreme biohackers on Reddit and then some of yeah. the private forums they prefer this one over fluvoxamine. But I would yeah. consider that to be like in stage neurogenesis. So yeah. maybe, you know, people, if you're, if you're interested in neurogenesis, okay, we have Nupept, we have Uridine, we have uh, Dihexa, right? one or two studies that actually show it. So, and, and you can't really yep. use Dihexa daily, maybe once a week. Samax, right. uh, yep. Salank, uh, Cerebral Lysin, right? There's a lot of things you can explore before you go on an SSRI. But, but for yep. me, I found it to be highly beneficial. Yeah, and I stopped it maybe well, almost four months ago now, but the neurogenic okay. effects are still there. I haven't touched any neurogenic aids well, besides uridine monophosphate in, in, in a very long time. And cerebral lysin was a year ago. Some acts was over one and a half years ago. But these effects, wow. they kind of remain. Yeah. Totally. And no no sexual sides from the SSRI? No, but I was on TRT. And my right. Wife is I mean, hot, so that helps. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, man. You need that, bro. That yeah. seems to be one of the yeah. common themes. Like, you know, SSRIs for a, a small subset of men, it just messes with their sexual function. Oh, it, for, a lot. For, for a lot. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's difficult to say exactly how, how you know, this excessive serotonin synaptically is, is doing that, but it always comes back down to the downstream hormones. And, and the, the, even if you're in normal range, it, it's still, you may need to have higher levels of, you know, total tests and serum tests and your estradiol in the right place for a sustained period of time to get better. Uh, but what seems to be the, the case is that, because there are guys that don't get sexual side effects, like like you describe, and, yeah. and you just mm-hmm. said, like, you're aggressively or at least consciously managing androgens, right? So, like, mm-hmm. that seems to be the difference. I think it's a huge bit. Yeah, if all those things are in check and you're conscious of it, then you know you you, you run a lot less risk of any side effects from you know, from SSRIs. With, with the SSRIs, there's there's um, a huge negative effect on your mitochondrial function. Oh of yeah. Of course, downstream, you know, yeah, downstream, of course, that will inhibit uh, the production of sex hormones. But when mm-hmm. you're already on TRT or a little bit more, and I was on an extensive mitochondrial support stack with NAD plus, uh, NMN, oh. you know, antioxidants and you know, MOTC and all these peptides. So I was completely upregulated and optimized. 
And right. then you add in the fluvoxamine, you mitigate all these negative effects that it could potentially have. Yeah. And then I only got the benefits. And even when yeah. I came off it, most people get severely depressive or, or yeah. they get, you know, side effects. And, I, you know, I was stupid enough to stop at cold turkey, which nobody should do. Right. Um, so I had, I had side effects for like two or three weeks, right? These brain zaps and all these. Yeah, it was mm. horrible. But, yeah. because, but because I was on TRT and, and supporting mitochondrial function, you know, it was yeah. manageable. Right. Yeah. So huge point, huge point, I, huge major if, kind of clarification for people. Yeah. I think if I didn't do that, I'll be miserable. 100%. Yeah, right. My libido yeah. would be impaired and, and my yep. productivity and then probably also the coming off would, would have been horrible as well. Because oh, if you go to like these um, websites where they talk about how to come off SSRIs after decades yeah. of use and yeah. the side effects that people experience of that. So that's yeah. why I say it's end, end stage. But yeah. I'm going to be brutally honest. I can't wait to get back on Fluvox. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, the, the, you know, the, the, I, I don't know if I believe it's probably the same mechanism of most other SSRIs where it's uh, inhibiting mm -hmm. the, ser the, the serotonin transporter, which yeah. mm -hmm. acts to degrade, you know, serotonin or recycle it or whatever. I mean, you know, the right levels of serotonin make a dramatic difference in how you feel. I mean, it's just like, it's just yeah. very important. And the, the, the discussion around SSRIs and some of the sexual side effects has sort of forgotten about, you know, the power of serotonin. Like, you know, for a normal person that again is maintaining their androgens, making sure it's testosterone is in the right place. Like it's imperative. Like I, I almost know when I need to increase the synthesis, the quantity, just loading precursors in there to serotonin, like, cause I just start you know, feeling a little like bland about shit. Like, you know, life is just a right. little less, mm -hmm. you know? And so, um, it's, it's an important neurotransmitter. Yeah. No, so I, I found it to be beneficial. I just wondered if you experiment with some of these neurogenic aids and of course, like cerebral lysine, that's a huge commitment of injections because it's like two to five, maybe 10 milliliters per day. And oh, is it? That's yeah. Way, yeah. That's way beyond TRT. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. The injection volume of TRT is tiny compared to cerebral lysine. Oh yeah, um, totally. Even yeah, even though the injections are super smooth because it's water based, yeah. no pain, no post injection pain, no no issues. Well, that's good. Um, yeah. I wanted to uh, ask you. So, so so switching gears for a second. Um, mm -hmm. On so I have a couple questions for you, uh, kind yeah. of related to all, all of this stuff. Um, sure, but. You mentioned on a video recently, and I think this would be good for a lot of my followers um, and me too, because this actually happened to me when I took my total test like to 1250 or something. I had a bunch of side mm -hmm. effects. You, you talked about um, TRT and your testosterone getting past a certain level and having insomnia. Yeah. So, you know, what it looks like is happening, um, and I forget exactly how you mentioned like what, what you think is happening, but it seems like catecholamines are definitely involved in this epinephrine, mm -hmm. norepinephrine, yeah. dopamine, but you know, what is your, and peep guys seem to get alleviation from this by lowering their dose. Ultimately, at least that's mm -hmm. been my experience in researching this. You know, what, what is the mechanism from your perspective there and how do guys go about that? Because I think a lot of people get to a great place where they're like, wow, libido is mm -hmm. great. You're walking around with boners all day. And they're like, this feels <laughs> great. But, right. but then, yeah, they, you know, this, they can't sleep. Yeah, go ahead. So. Yeah, again, they need that uh, I, I car and the erectogenic uh, AIDS. Oh, yeah. And that video made me laugh. It was great. Um, yeah. <laughs> that was a good video. So, you know, it's it's usually multifactorial. So one of this is, you know, the testosterone raising dopamine levels, right? And that can keep you awake and a catecholamine release of norepinephrine and stuff. And if you do your testosterone injections later in the day, um, you might get an increased boost. Right? Testosterone yeah. boosts your metabolism. So yeah. if you're if you're taking your testosterone later in the day out of convenience, then maybe during that day or the day in the following day, you're a little bit more more difficult to fall asleep, a little bit more insomnia. So if yeah. you space it to in the morning, and again, daily subcutaneous microadministration, so the peaks and valleys are not substantial, that's right. one of the ways around it, right? So everything yeah. is nice and stable, and by the evening time, most of your testosterone has already tapered compared to the, in the morning. And when you look at all of the clinical research regarding uh, testosterone esters and carrier oils and injection sites, long yeah. story short, most of them peak within the first two days. But the peaks are higher or lower, and then they start to taper. It's just, yeah. you know, that's the way these these compounds are absorbed. So ideally, daily injections sub Q will minimize the peaks, 
and and stabilize the the, the troughs, you know, that it tapers. Yeah, off. a lot of the guys that that complain of this are like we talked about, like getting a cookie cutter instruction from the clinic yeah, and they're dosing. Totally. I mean, they're dosing like 200 milligrams a week and and whatever that may be fine for some guys, but like a lot of them are doing it all at once. They're just like, all right, going for your once, you know, your biweekly, you know, right. burst of testosterone. And it's like, wow, I could not even imagine how that feels to have that much test. Like, of course, it's going to disrupt your sleep via all this catecholamine mm -hmm. synthesis stuff. When I went on HCG and took, you know, that was the main side effect that I had when I took my numbers past mm -hmm. 1200. You know, below 1200 yeah. fine 900 the thousand total test is kind of where i like to where i feel the best but when i got mm -hmm. up to 1200 1250 like i couldn't sleep like i'd be laying in bed and my heart would be racing and i'd be just like <laughs> thinking shit and like you know for yeah. zero reason like you know and then um i was anxious like just like normal stuff mm -hmm. that would 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 not make me like anxious was just like fucking paralyzing me dude it was weird yeah. Um, so yeah, I had to get, you know, in that case, cause I was injecting HCG, I just had to, I ended up removing it ultimately at that point. It was kind of just an experiment to begin with, right. but, um, you know, my most recent labs doing TRT with this dose, I was at 1050 total test, you know, just at the mm -hmm. top of the reference range free test. So like, mm -hmm. I feel great there. Like, I don't want to go above it. <laughs> you know, I don't want to go below it and right. I want to be able to sleep. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, it's very important. You know, I mean, if you miss a couple of days of good sleep, you just feel off, you know, and productivity yeah, goes down. And, totally. you know, especially if you're self employed and you, you know, you're busy all the time, then you can't even miss a day of sleep. So I, I think like daily micro administrations is the easiest way to circumvent that. And keep in mind when you're going testosterone replacement, okay, you get testosterone exogenously that converts into estradiol. Now you're missing out on DHEA, pregnenolone, esterone estriol to a certain extent and maybe your dihydro testosterone levels are too high right converting mm. from test into dht so mm -hmm. you're by definition if you go into your t you're kind of creating this hormonal imbalance that you now have mm -hmm. to manage and within the first two months you felt, might feel great and then slowly right. over time your dha dha sulfate levels pregnenolone pregnenolone sulfate levels decline and these mm. neurosteroids as the name implies they help with neurotransmission and especially right. DHEA helps with GABA-A receptor uh, sensitivity. So yep. what does GABA-A do? It helps you relax at the end of the day. So mm -hmm. some people report that if they supplement with DHEA uh, later in the day, that they get mm -hmm. a little bit of a relaxing uh, sensation, a little bit of a soothing effect. And if they combine that with GABA, they get an even better effect. Now, a low dose of GABA, we're talking about 300, 500 milligrams. Um, and you don't need much. You don't need to make it those 3000 milligrams, right. um, unless you're on like a gram of test per week, but that's not TRT anymore. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's like my realm <laughs> of dosing. Oh man. So yeah. Yeah. Bodybuilder so, realm. so right. Bodybuilder realm. So if you're using like 25 milligrams of DHEA and again, some people notice that they stay awake if they dose it. Some people notice that they, uh, get a little bit sleepy so everybody responds differently everybody mm. converts the dhea into dhs sulfate or testosterone or estradiol downstream at a different rate so figure yeah. out what your dosing protocol is that allows you to sleep later in the day and then supplement with a little bit of pregnant alone on top some people respond well some people don't so maybe start dha first give that a try for two weeks figure out when to dose that and add in pregnant alone figure out how to dose that and then uh, and then and then take it from there and most guys if they're on testosterone DHEA and pregnenolone or testosterone and DHEA, they actually feel more zen. They're more yeah. balanced. Right? So that's so really interesting, dude. So, so like you suggest anybody going on TRT or at least most guys because of this, mm -hmm. you know, neurosteroid, potential neurosteroid imbalance that, that happens after you start, yeah. that they start taking pregnenolone and DHEA. That's your suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, so because wow. when you take testosterone, your HPTA is shut down, right? The signaling yep. of the LH and the FSH to the testicles is is downregulated. Okay, that's fine. You take testosterone for that, right? It's like, yeah. you, you know, it goes both ways. And right. then the signaling of LH to FSH to your adrenal glands also mm. shuts down. So now you right. produce less DHA and less pregnenolone. Now you, you mm. don't stop producing it completely, but right. your DHA and pregnenolone will be like at the bottom or slightly under the reference range. Yeah, um, while your testosterone is at the top, hormonal imbalance. So, yeah. so do you think, you have to do you bring, think a lot of guys that, that, that have this insomnia or this excessive anxiety from TRT, do you think some of them can 
leave their doses the same and just bring in DHA and pregnenolone to balance it out. Yeah. Is that'll work for some for some guys? Yeah, just keep in mind that your testosterone dose will go up by adding in DHEA. Um, so please uh, do your blood work before, get a baseline, add in your DHEA, figure out what dose is good for you. And then you might have to reduce the dose because your testosterone levels go up and your estrogen levels go up, right? That's ultimately the target of DHEA. And, and you know, if you supplement with lower dose, maybe twice uh, twice per day, then like testosterone is a buffer, right? You have testosterone in a date. One second, I, I got a... You got a cat, a cat. don't you? I got six cats and they always want oh, attention around this. Dude, time. you're so, a crazy cat, man. Whoa, yeah. I didn't know that about you, bro. <laughs> That's usually, awesome. Like my, my, my wife went to bed and then, you know, usually they start demanding attention. But if I have a podcast, mm -hmm. say, I got I to gotta tease one. <laughs> so, yeah, you got to get to him, man. This is real cat. This is cat duty right here, folks. This is a real thing, dude. God tend to your cats. My cats absolutely do that to me. They they find the perfect time when I'm doing a podcast. I was just telling your Sorry audience, my that. cats, that's okay. My yeah. cats do the same thing, dude. Like when I'm podcasting, especially like if I'm recording a video or live streams, they get me on the live stream, bro. Right. They, they want the attention, up. you know, they want yeah, it. It's like they know. They're alert. How, how many cats you got? I got two, boy and a girl. They're, they're nice. I mean, I complain about them, but they're awesome. I mean, they're just, cats are just different. Like, dogs I are cool. It. Uh, but you know, cats are just like, you know, you can connect with them and they do cuddle and they're, you know what I mean? And they're right. smart. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mines are very smart. So smart that they know how to open doors. So I'm in the middle of recording and then they just uh -huh. jump in. <laughs> what are you great, doing? <laughs> I love yeah, it. it's fun. So, so I chase them out. So yeah. hopefully they'll be quiet for at least 30 minutes. Okay. So where 30. were we? Okay. So yeah. So the DHEA. So a lot of guys notice that if they supplement with DHA, it's better to split it morning and evening because you need mm. some DHA to convert into DHA sulfate, which is the buffer, like testosterone right. inothate. And then while you're not supplementing with DHA, you can slowly release. All right. So this way you have kind of like a consistent reservoir of serum free DHA coming from the DHA sulfate, same with pregnenolone. So mm -hmm. that's, this is why I, I think one of the first in this space that actually started recommending it. And now a lot of TRT clinics uh, believe in DHA. Of course, it doesn't work yeah. for everybody. And when you start yeah. doing the research about DHA, mm -hmm. the, the doses are very high, but that's only studied in the elderly, which are already antigen huh. deficient. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there's a I lot of things for which that's the case. And my clinic tried to tried to say, hey, I mean, I think we tested DHA and it was in a reasonable range, but you know, they were like, mm -hmm. hey, you may get to a point where you may want this. So I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, you'll see, you'll see, like two or three months from now, where your DHA levels will just be bottomed out, mm. and then and then you just supplement or you go on HCG because HCG also stimulates DHA and pregnenolone production and keeps you fertile. You know, keeps your ball size nice uh, and yeah. full. You know, because that will go down also. Keeps your yeah. semen quality high, uh, keeps your libido good because your hormone balance right. is better. So test DHEA, pregnenolone, and HCG, and dinylmethane. And yeah. it's like golden stock for HRT and maybe some growth. Hormone, so but, you know. on that <laughs> note, um, what happened to make HCG, you know, so less available? I mean, my clinic, I'm not sure if they ever offered it. They, they basically just insert Clomid and they're like, well, that's, you know, gonadotropin replacement. But, um, you know, a lot of companies that used to have it don't have it. I mean, what, what's your take on, on what happened there and how, how does one go about procuring it otherwise? So ne next time there's an opportunity to vote, vote for the other guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely. <laughs> so is that it? Does it have to do with the pharmaceutical companies or something? Yeah, so so Biden was one of the first ones that actually uh, introduced the Steroid Control Act of 1992, and I think he also wow. had a hand in this uh, new uh, rules that ACG is labeled as a biological because right. it's a bi bioidentical compound, right? So the restrictions are higher, and it means wow. that the productions have uh, changed. So a lot of the generic ACG that you know was produced in China or India that a lot of the compounding pharmacies were using for their own uh, labeling is no yeah. longer available. And when it is available, right. it's a hundred dollars. Oh like yeah. Whole, wholesale, not retail, That's wholesale. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so luckily, you know, the, the pharmaceuticals that there's now recombinant HCG available, uh, Merck Ovitrel has those, um, 6,500 IU syringes, which are for tier T purposes are impossible to dose because you need 250 IUs three times a week. Right. And these are 6,500 right. in yeah. like half a milliliter. 
Well, yeah, who are so they you, making you, them for? Pregnant women? I mean, who, who takes that money? No, the, yeah, so for people who want to get pregnant, right? It's one shot, ah, 6,500 yeah. units. Good luck. It? It's like to start... It's like testosterone began away. It's uh, Nubido, right? One shot, you're good for 12 weeks. And this is one shot, wow. you're good for a week or two because it has a longer active life. But, yeah. you know, we like to microdose and take things right. into our own hands. So the protocols yeah, that control we do are different. All. Yeah, right. We control all the variables. So so the best thing you can do is if you have access to it, Merck Ovitril or another recombinant HCG, you transfer that into a sterile vial, which you can buy on Amazon. And then mm-hmm. you draw like you know, 0.2 or 0.02 milliliters, literally one line on the insulin syringe. So it's right. you're like, why am I wasting my insulin syringe for like this much? Yeah, dude. <laughs> That's yeah. how little- Good thing they're just, cheap. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. So those are cheap and, and, and the pens are actually quite affordable. They're like 40 bucks and it will last you several weeks. Interesting, so, I did not you know, know yeah, that. I will have to yeah. look into that, man. Yeah, you'll, you'll have to source that yourself. You know, um, yeah, because when you know, the time comes for, you know, fertility, like, I don't know, I might, I just got over a relationship a year and a half ago or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I've been single and dating and whatever. So not really concerned about that. But when, um, when the time comes, you know, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to yeah. agonize the LH FSH receptors to start producing. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's so, um, yeah, the most cost effective way is just to keep a low dose of ATG in there. And then at least your testicles are not fully shut down. They're not functioning yeah. optimally. But at right. least they're not fully shut down. And then when you do come off TRT or you want to get, get somebody pregnant, then the fertility protocol is actually quite easy. So, you know, I've been using HCG for over a year now. And after like 12 years of steroid use, almost continuously with no breaks, my, yeah. my semen parameters are still stellar. So 73 That's million great. per yeah per million and a good motility, good morphology. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. So, but... That's because I've been using ATG for such a long time. Yeah. Right. So what's your take on gonadarelin then? I mean, that the, all, all sort of, uh, you know, anecdotals, et cetera, seem to point to less effective, um, you, you know, didn't work for than me. HCG <laughs> or Clomid or something. What yeah. What is your take on that? Is it completely useless? And why are they prescribing that? So I think like, you have to look at it at, at men who are uh, pituitary lazy. Like I am, mm. like I shut my pituitary off when I was 26, right? Mm. So my LH and FSH secretion is not stellar. My growth hormone levels are a little bit low. And and yeah. so if I go and go Nadarelin or Bucerelin or, or low dose Tripterelin, which I, I don't really recommend people to do because that's literally used for castration purposes. Yeah, it's, but those dosages are like 11 milligrams, not not 250 micrograms, you know? Wow. Um, okay. So if you, if you use like lower dosages you should be able to get away with it but if your pituitary is lazy then the lh and fsh secretion are not going to be that high it's the same as with growth hormone secretagogues if you're older your pituitary is kind of like oh, i have a growth hormone forget about it you know mk677 or ghrp6 or whatever it's, it's just not going to do much i think it mm-hmm. does work when you're y- younger and then there's kiss mm-hmm. 10 which you yeah. know works in the hypothalamus it didn't work for me also but you know, sometimes like once in a blue moon, I talk to a guy who uses it and says he gets good results and then ask for labs and they disappear. Uh-huh. <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, and so, it's, hard, it's impossible to tell. Like if, you know, if you're, unless you're running labs, it's impossible to tell if it's actually making you make more testosterone. I mean, you can right. go off a subjective feel all you want, but I mean, it's just, you know, mm. come to learn that doesn't tell the whole picture. You need to kind of see yeah. it. Um, so I don't know. So I don't have you, much faith much face in those compounds. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. So you would, yeah, you would suggest HCG over gonadarel on any day. Uh, what about comparing yeah. that to Clomid in, in, in terms of maintaining fertility? And obviously that changes your testosterone numbers because it's going to make you make more tests seemingly mm-hmm. at a higher level. Is that your take on it? And, and what do you think of Clomid? Yeah. So Clomid monotherapy and HCG monotherapy has been around for a long time. Just it's, yeah. it's rarely discussed in, uh, in TRT circles, especially rarely discussed in bodybuilding circles, but it's been around for ages. But, you know, HCG monotherapy, I prefer much uh, more because you can kind of control your testosterone levels based on the dose of HCG that you're taking. And with yeah. clomiphene, um, you're kind of dependent on your pituitary again. Now, the right. problem with clomiphene is that it's, it has two stereoisomers. So you have zooclomiphene and enclomiphene. And okay. I believe it's enclomiphene is about uh, two-thirds and zooclomiphene is about one-thirds. And all the side effects are coming from zooclomiphene. So the, the, mm. the mood changes and the, uh, the irritability and the cr- crying for no reason, right? No Titanic <laughs> on clomiphene. You can't watch Titanic. It's, forget about it. Right. 
Oh man, <laughs> can't watch that. Um, and and even the ocular changes are, are yeah. suspected to come from zuclomiphene. So mm. you know, if you see those tracers in your eyes, or you feel like you have blurry vision, which some people report from yeah, you know, a week I've of seen that. I've heard yeah. and seen that. So it's 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 very scary. So if anybody wants to go on uh, something similar like this, a CERM treatment, selective estrogen receptor modulator, just use enclomiphene by itself. The problem is not so much data on enclomiphene by itself. All the data is on clomid, which is zuclomiphene right. and enclomiphene. So this, this right. is a little bit troubling, but I believe that enclomiphene is um, more sustainable than clomiphene. Um, but again, the, the data regarding ocular changes isn't there, but at least the mm. mood changes um, right. aren't reported. So you see that LH and FSH levels are quite high, um, yeah. maybe six, eight, sometimes even 12 milli wow. IUs per milliliter, and, and that would result in pretty high testosterone levels. So I've seen mm-hmm. on enclomiphene monotherapy, 25 milligrams per day, I've seen 1,000 nanograms per deciliter, easy. Wow. Yeah, these okay. are Got androgen it. deficient guys that are, have like 300 nanograms before, and they triple, right. quadruple it. Yeah. Oh, totally. Absolutely. Yeah. That, yeah, that's interesting to know, man. I mean, all those side effects are, are pretty widely reported, and clomid, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, it's just like... I have directed men to take Clomid before for certain situations, right? But rarely have, you know, has there been a situation where there wasn't some sort of noticeable side effect. Yeah. I, I think it's like a short-term thing for post-cycle therapy or just, yeah. you know, availability for some people, right? You have a consultation with a guy, can't get HCG, can't get this, can't yep. get that. Okay. Right. What do you have access to? Okay, Clomid. Try it for a month. Yes, totally. You pull your labs, see how you feel. Keep a little uh, yeah. uh, uh, PED diary on how you feel, you know, and 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 then after a month, you kind of report to yourself what happened. And and okay, testosterone levels went up, but my uh, mood also worsened. Okay, then it's mm-hmm. not worth it. Maybe you have to source something else. So, right. yeah, but I don't know anybody that run runs clomid or enclomiphene like for a year or two straight and then reports yeah. back that they had a good experience. So. Right. I mean, totally. I couldn't imagine. Yeah, it's just it's harder to control too. The thing about testosterone mm-hmm. or TRT that I think I like mm-hmm. a lot is like once you once you look at your labs and you know what dose that you've been dosing for the last you know month and a half you kind of know where your numbers are going to end up. Whereas I think I feel like with Glomid, it's just a lot less, you can be a lot less particular with it. You know what I mean? It's like your numbers Mm -hmm. will go, you know, shoot up to 1200 or something total test by taking 25 milligrams a day or 50 milligrams a day. And then what you got to, you know, get a pill cutter and cut the thing and then try to, you know, take it and then run your labs again. It just seems a lot less kind of dialed in compared to TRT as far as like what you can. Yeah. And keep in mind that, you know, natural testosterone production is, is fluctuated, right? Yeah, so right. You, know, you, you don't sleep good for a night, testosterone is low. And then you sleep good for a night and you have a couple hamburgers and, and a promotion at work, <laughs> testosterone levels are going to be high. So you're still yeah. fluctuating. And this yeah. is the, the whole idea we want to get away from these fluctuations. We want to feel leveled so we can always count on our energy levels and our mood and our productivity so we can be the best man we possibly can. And, and that's why I prefer TRT over HCG monotherapy or enclomiphene monotherapy. I mean, I notice it myself now. I've been off TRT for almost a month and I'm, yeah. I'm running like a thousand HCG and 75 IOs HMG. And, oh, cool. and my energy levels and mood and productivity is, you know, um, fluctuating quite a, yep. quite a bit, you know, and, and, I'm completely dialed in with my nutrition and my circadian rhythm and my sleep. And so, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I think all things considering TRT wins. Yeah, for Hands sure. Down, yeah, for know? sure. But you know, not everybody's willing to inject, right? Not everybody wants yeah. to start pinning. So, yeah. yeah I mean, it's a, a scary thing for guys. Like, you know, I, I've directed guys to, to go on TRT and we've set protocols and it's always a little, you know, intimidating in the beginning, right? If, if someone's not used to, you know, either injecting themselves intramuscularly or if they've never done a subcutaneous, in- just the idea of putting a needle in you know, your body, right? It's like, it just, it's yeah. so scary, but um, you know what I mean? It's just bizarre, right? And you're not, you're used to leaving that to medical professionals. So you're like, well, I couldn't possibly do this safely, but um, yeah, it's, it's yeah. just, it's just, it's just very easy. Th- these days, like the instructional videos on YouTube, and, you know, yeah. how, you know, these clinics situate supplying you with the right syringes, it's all very, very mm-hmm. kind of neatly packed. Whereas, I don't, I mean, you know, again, 10 yeah. years ago, a lot of this stuff wasn't as refined. You, you probably could only get, 
um, you know, you're, you're, I don't even think you were getting vials of testosterone back then. It's like you go to your doc, they shoot you with 200. Oh, yeah, you could. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you could. <laughs> so, well, you could. So yeah, I did yeah. My first yeah. cycle. Yeah. So, so 13 years ago, 13, 14 years ago, when I did my first cycle when I was 26, um, yeah. I was doing research for years because I was already into bodybuilding for 10, 11 years. So yeah. I knew only to get pharmaceutical grade. So I got ampules mm. uh, of testosterone. And yep. then I got my uh, injection material from a local pharmacy and I pretended that I needed this for, I don't know, some sort of project because they don't want you to start, you know, shooting yourself up. So I had to right. lie a little bit. I'm sorry, uh, medical professionals, but, you know, uh -huh. you got to take life into your own hands. And totally. then, you know, you fill up your syringe with an 18 gauge, you switch it to a, a what was it? I think like a 25 gauge. So it's quite a thin wow. one, right? And then you sit yeah. there, you have, you have the needle, the long one, one and a half inch, and you sit there and you're like, I don't think I can do this. <laughs> yeah, bro. That's the so hard scared. things that people talk about. I couldn't yeah. imagine. But that's bodybuilding. We didn't know about insulin microinjections. Right. Nobody talked about that. Nobody talked yeah. about using right. insulin syringes. We went, it's got to go deep intramuscular, one and a half inch. So you sit there with this like fucking harpoon. And even though it's Dude. thin, uh, yeah. yeah, it's still it's still long. So you sit there it's next totally to your leg, you know, because Absolutely. you don't have, yeah, you don't have the, the flexibility yet to inject your glutes, and then right. you slowly go into the skin and it hurts. And you're like, ooh, and then you pass the skin and it doesn't hurt at all. And you're like, wait a minute, yeah. why was I so scared? Right, the, it's it's in the skin. It's in the skin that it hurts. So that whole one and a half inch that goes in all the way to the middle of your quad, you're like, oh right. man, it didn't didn't bother me at all. You start injecting, it's smooth, you take it out, a little wipe, a little bit of the blood, you go to the yeah. gym, you have a killer workout because now you're part of the team. And then the next day, yeah. post injection. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. That's hilarious. Yeah. I mean, it is always the, the, the first like injection or something that that is creepy for people. And, and you're right. I mean, once you get past the, you know, the subcutaneous tissue, like you, you don't, I feel maybe the, the few times that I've injected intramuscular, I feel like a dull kind of mm. like, I sort of feel like I can, I can tell the difference between it hitting my muscle and just being in the subcute tissue. Um, right. but yeah, I mean, these days things being as easy as they are, like, I mean, an insulin pin is like the, the easiest thing. Like you, you, honestly, I don't feel it some days. Some days I don't feel it at all, which is bizarre. <laughs> no, no, I think you get used to it. You know what pain to expect. It's just the first couple of injections. You're not really sure what's going to happen. And, right. and you know, for the people who ever did blood work, I think, you know, drawing blood from one of the uh, veins, that's more painful, more uncomfortable yeah. than actually doing your own injections. And of course, totally. you know, when, oh, you, totally. when you get vaccinated, yeah, vaccinated vaccines are also a little bit weird. You know, because yeah. those give horrible post-injection pain every time, you know, yeah, totally. recent ones, old ones, you're, you can't even lift your arm. So, but it, yeah. yeah, TRT doing it by yourself, it's kind of like Disneyland compared to that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anything else here? We have, I asked you all of my questions, man, and you answered them pretty oh, good. good. Um, any other questions on nootropics? Any other topics on nootropics you want to touch on? Yeah, so so like I wanted to discuss like verbal fluency, and it's mostly for ah. myself because when when I watch your videos, like your everything rolls off the tongue like a fucking boss, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting here recording videos still for like an hour or two, and then I have to trim it down to twenty minutes because I mispronounce right. and and it's weird. Like on podcasts, I'm stellar, right? I'm totally yeah. fine. But you know, you bounce ideas back and forth. You can uh, discuss it. If, if I mispronounce somewhere, you kind of continue. But if I sit there by myself recording videos, I'm like, but, 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 especially right. medical jargon, it's horrible. Yeah. So yeah. write me a nootropic stack for verbal <laughs> fluency, please. <laughs> well, you, you have a couple, well, you have at least one powerful ingredient as a star, and that's uridine. Uridine yeah. is, is effective, usually more in combination with other things, but it's like a staple nootropic to have for verbal fluency. Because stepping back, like, you, you know, verbal fluency is working memory, it's episodic memory, it's information retrieval. And then it's like the neurochemistry of serving that up to your, you know, to your mouth and get, getting it out. Um, so uridine as a staple, the dose range is going to differ between people. 100 to 300 milligrams is kind of the range that I would stick with. But if you pair uridine with citicoline, which is CDP choline, uh, right. just another bioavailable choline source, gives your brain some usable acetylcholine. 
and you dose that in like 30 to 80 milligram quantities. And then uh -huh. on top of that, you, you bring in new pept, the compound we were talking mm -hmm. about before, dose that in five to 10 milligram quantities. Well, then mm -hmm. you really have a potent verbal fluency stack that that's targeting kind of all the underlying things related to verbal fluency. So that that's, that would be like my first suggestion. Um, second to that though, I, I think for me, it is as long as I have good stable brain energy, I am mm -hmm. relaxed, right? Because the, the, the yeah. more anxious yeah. I might be, or like the more overstimulated I might be, the less verbally mm -hmm. fluent I'm going to be for sure. Yeah. Right. So I, I think is a nice balance that you have to strike with stimulant nootropics and then potentially in some cases, even bringing in things like L-theanine and amino acid that affects GABA and serotonin. Uh, no, I think you mentioned- kind of relax you. Yeah, relax yeah, you a little bit. Right, because yeah, I mean, there's a there's a point at which the the overstimulation of neurotransmitters, the, the excitatory ones, mm. I mean, you're probably great at multitasking and maybe you can get some laptop work done. But when it comes to, you know, interacting with humans or speech or something, like you need to slow that down a little bit. And so a great strategy is have your- you know, have your nootropic compounds that are energizing you and making you feel functional in the mix, but then bring in theanine, maybe a compound called picamillin, which gives you brain available GABA. You know, it's, it's more potent in terms of its kind of brain tissue concentration of GABA than, um, than regular GABA. Um, that there's a compound. Sedating? The, what is it called? Picamillin. Picamillin. No. Yeah. Picamillin. Yeah. Just how it sounds. I think it's P I C A M O L I N something to this effect. It's, mm -hmm. it's different for different people, but if you have a pretty strong stimulating nootropic stack in the mix and then you bring picamillin on top of it, it, it just kind of takes the edge off. Now people should obviously right. dose it, you know, in a titrating manner, like maybe start with like mm -hmm. 20 milligrams of, of that stuff. If you're going to use pick and right. work your way up to a hundred, if you need to, and just kind of see where you, where you land. But, um, but yeah, no, it, it, in let for me personally, unless I'm pushing 150, 200 milligrams of that stuff, it doesn't sedate me. It just okay. what it's doing is giving you a little more GABA concentrations to kind of edge off the excitatory neurotransmission from right, some of the other right. stuff. Yeah, that's I good. That's a, I, some, something that I notice myself, right? If I'm too stimulated or if I did too much preparation, then it's all in my brain. That's yeah. why today I recorded a video. Yeah, today I, I had like 26 pages of notes right, of, of what I wanted to present about uh, boldenone versus kidney health. So that was a huge deep dive video that I prepared for. Then it's all yeah. in your brain. And the, like, I'm like, man, where do I start? <laughs> you know, you start explaining stuff based on your notes, but then you realize something, okay, this is later on and you start stumbling over your words. But this, this sounds very interesting to me. Yeah. Pick a million. Yeah. On, on a, yeah. Let, let's compare that to GABA supplementation or Fenibut supplementation. Like, let's say you have a low dose of GABA, a low dose of Fenibut to kind of take the edge off at the end of the day. We're like, how on a scale from one to 10 would be like a substantial dose of this pick a million compare? Is it comparable? Yeah, it can be comparable. I think you'd have to take, you know, to reach Fenibut like effects, which mm -hmm. Fenibut, uh, believes GABA, GABA B receptor modulator, I, I probably has some action at the GABA A, comparable to a benzo, so very effective in, in reducing yeah. anxiety. Um, you would have to dose picamillin in like the minimally 300 to, you know, 700 milligram quantities. And most people aren't going to want to go that high because of that. Mm -hmm effect. So it, yeah, it can be comparable so long as you're dosing it, you know, in, 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 in that range, you know, micro dosing it or dosing it in, in again, a hundred or so milligrams uh, on the low end, 20 on the high end, a hundred milligrams. That's kind of where you get that, that solid okay. balance. But then, I mean, there's, there's times like where it's like, I don't know, I don't, I don't love Fenibut just because of its action on uh GABA B and how potent mm -hmm. it is. And there could be withdrawals yeah. from it. Yeah, but for like, sleeping, just that, that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. It'll knock you out, man. But yeah. you know, for um for those times when you kind of just need to remember what it feels like to not have an overactive brain, like like mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, especially like like I know what you mean. Like we're just we're ADD in our own right, and we think all right. of the time, and so there's just always shit going on. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Fenibut is amazing for slowing some of that stuff down, but but Picamillin could be a good alternative. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in this compound. I'll definitely start uh, researching a little bit more. This sounds like a compound you would 
definitely have in the back of your pocket when there's public speaking involved, because that's sure, probably the definitely. most the most important, like a TED talk, for example. Not mm-hmm. not that I would ever mm-hmm. get invited to a TED talk, but right. something of that nature, you know, where you know that okay, I'm sitting in front of like a yeah, you never know, right? You sit in front of a thousand people, and then also when the video goes live, you get like six million views. Yeah, that, yeah. that's <laughs> Piccamilla would definitely Insane. help with that. Imagine yeah. the anxiety that comes with that. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. It, dude, it'd be nuts. Like, um, but yeah, it, it's. I just think it's about striking that balance. You know, the stimulation is is useful mm. for kind of the cognitive function that you need to recall all the stuff that you're going to say and whatever. Mm. But you know, the the toning down of some of that stimulation, which doesn't negate mm. the stimulation, it just balances that. I mean, that's how right. verbal fluency ultimately happens but on the other hand i mean like i don't know i've always been a photogenic guy or a charismatic dude like so verbal fluency like i i am better at that i guess naturally because i don't think about what i'm saying as much perhaps as other people and so that mm-hmm. helps but uh largely yeah. it's otherwise it's manipulatable via neutral mix for sure so would that would that be able to be compounded into like a formula because now that YouTube is getting more popular and I notice it, like I have consultations with guys that want to get started on YouTube and because I struggle mm-hmm. a little bit with the recording myself sometimes. Yeah. Um, like you see all these new tropics for gaming, uh, you see right. these new tropics for studying, you know, the, the Adderall replacements and the modafinil replacements. And, and, but I don't see anything for verbal fluency. And then everybody's right. on social media now, right? The, the TikTok, yeah. Instagram, YouTube, oh. and, a lot of people are not so good at the presenting part, or at least not yet. Right. And and yep. I feel that I still suck after five years on YouTube. Um, yeah, <laughs> me too. Sometimes, it. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. it's horrible. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a horrible. gradual thing, man. You get better yeah. over the years. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, it, I think there will be a market for it. Yeah. Uh huh. Definitely. There's there are a couple of pre-made stacks that are effective at that. We make one, so it's called Cortex. I have it right in front of me here. This mm. stuff has uridine, uh, city choline. It's got artichoke extract. Has some bacopa in it. So I was started taking this before we made it a commercial stack. I don't mm. know, ten years ago, and I was like looking for a modafinil alternative, and I've I right. found it in in that stack. But I also realized when I took it it made me like a lot more verbally fluent than normal. So cortex is a good option. Again, Mm -hmm. uridine, CDP choline, artichoke extract, and bacopa. People can play around the doses. They want to do that themselves to kind of put that stuff together and and get in a good place. Um, But yeah, otherwise there, there are, I'll tell you what, there are no formulations that, that are marketed as verbal fluency nootropics. Right. So like that, that would, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've looked. What I what I like, like I haven't tried any of your products, of course, because uh, you know I'm sponsored by Gorilla Mind and I get their products uh, quite readily. Oh yeah, but yeah. So so Derek just cool. released the uh, Gorilla Mind Respawn, and it's actually yeah. very similar to your Cortex. It's got L-tyrosine, alpha GPC, mm. which is a different form of uh, choline, uridine monophosphate, yep. g- uh, mm. ginkgo biloba, and the L-theanine mm. to kind of take the edge off and a little bit of saffron extract. And then ah, notice that for. Cool. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. So I noticed that I, I've been taking this for the last couple of weeks, and my my video quality has definitely improved quite a bit. So Good, man. that's why, yeah, that's why I asked because I saw in your product list that you have some similar products. And I think yep. in in this day and age where people are getting on social media, you know, products like this, if you experiment it, and whatever product you like more, just fucking use that one. Yeah, you know, totally. There's there's, yep. there's there's so many different ones. You just go with the one that works for you. I think I yep. think it's very beneficial because in the end, like verbal fluency for youtube or social media in general that's kind of the future of yeah. of entrepreneurship right you use yes. social media as your marketing platform to show thousand percent. and and it's it sure as hell beats working for somebody else you know yeah i've, I've oh, done definitely. it for a couple of years and yeah and uh, even though the money was good it wasn't as good as being on youtube <laughs> Yeah, man. It's just not fun. And you're right. Like everybody and their sister is like a fucking TikToker now these days. Like it's totally, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. it's real. And they're all like filming themselves at the gym. You know, it's, it's getting uh, a little bit annoying, yeah. but for sure. I mean, nootropics, dude. I mean, they, they have, it's like when I got into it 15 years ago, they were popular and people knew about them and, mm-hmm. and people were taking them, but not a lot of people it's like this underground kind of thing. It was considered like yeah. cheating cognitively, yeah. but over the last 15 years, it's just become more and more popular. And now there are way more YouTubers out there talking about it. You know, most of the, you know, the highly effective entrepreneurs that 
that everybody knows about that may be publicly facing are probably using nootropics. I know certainly oh, some yeah. of them definitely are under my yeah. guidance. And so oh, yeah, it, it you is, got some of those guys, right? Yeah, yeah I, I know. Definitely. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's, it's just, you know, the, manipulating brain chemistry in a way that fosters the performance that you're trying to get for specific tasks is smart. You know, it's a 2023 yeah. thing and beyond. Yeah, but I think you know the, the the money that you spend on nootropics is marginal compared to the return of investment regarding business. It's, oh, totally. You know, so without we have nootropics, right? And then the the spicy nootropics we have aren't actually nootropics; are more like stimulants. So we have Adderall, Vivanci, mm-hmm. uh, what is it? But uh, another one, but, Buteron. What is it? That's another one. You Peron, possibly. I think it has some dopaminergic mechanisms. Yeah, there's a ton of stuff. Adderall, Vivance, and there was another. Oh, yeah, Vivance, right. Yep. I mean, those are, those are, you know, a lot of those are dopamine reuptake inhibitors. They basically just mm-hmm. make you keep more dopamine around. And that, yeah, I mean, that that is going to potently stimulate you. So they're, they're useful. All of those kind of pharmaceutical, well known study drugs, effectively can be useful. The problem with a lot of them is they, they come with side effects first of all, but secondly, like some of them can dysregulate dopamine receptors in a way and general dopamine signaling in a way, which when you get off of them and stop taking them, you do not function normally again. Right. So the, and that's terrible because I've got to pull guys out of those conditions. Sometimes Mm -hmm. Um, the, the benefit of nootropics and particularly like finding a couple stacks that work well for you, but maybe like mm-hmm. switching between them, not taking the same stack every day is that you you run a lot less of the risk of this receptor desensitization or kind of dysregulation of the dopaminergic or otherwise neurotransmitter systems. And so that's kind of the major benefit. Whereas with as Adderall, especially, man, I mean, it's it can crank your productivity up tenfold, right? No question yeah. about it. But, yeah. but, but, yeah, but then the side effects that you know, yeah. So, this, so the other the one was Dex. Dex De- sorry, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> the side, okay. Um, so, yeah. So the other one was dexedrine. So Adderall is okay. like a combination of uh, two kinds of uh, amphetamines, right? You have dextroamphetamine and levoamphetamines, but right. dexedrine is just pure dextroamphetamines, and some people respond uh-huh. better to that. But yeah. like in your in your professional experience, I've I've ran into a decent amount of people who use Adderall, uh, Vifons, or dexedrine, like daily for years because yeah. it's a prescription medication. But right. in your professional opinion, what should be like the maximum dosing of that? Like once a week, once every two weeks and, and you know, five milligrams, 10 milligrams. I know people that use 20 milligrams of Adderall per day, which is insane yeah. to me. Yeah, I but, know. It's a lot. Know, well, I mean, it, it should really, the dose is going to depend on you because people respond differently to doses. But, uh, you know, I think if you're going to be using Adderall specifically and some of these other analogs for brain performance in order to avoid side effects, you're probably going to want to only dose them twice, three times a week max. That would be my suggestion. Oh, wow. mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, as, as to avoid some of these larger scale side effects, because I've had guys come to me with horror stories and it took us six months in some cases yeah. longer to get them out of it, to make them feel normal again, everything from reduced cognitive function to reduced sexual function to anhedonia mm-hmm. and hosts of other things. And so oh, man. three times a week max is what I would be suggesting. Now you mentioned modafinil, modafinil though, it does keep dopamine around, it's also got mm-hmm. some other mechanisms and seems to induce less of the chance of some of these longer term side effects or yeah. these side effects coming off compared to Adderall or something. So right. you know, that's, a, that's a good option. But the beauty of nootropics is that a lot of them just don't do that, right? They, they're yeah. acutely, they're acutely effective in a four to six hour window, call it. Mm-hmm. at inducing, you know, uh, higher quantities or better signaling of neurotransmitters and neurotransmitter systems. And then, you know, they're out of your system, right? They, they stop yeah. working, mm-hmm. you go to sleep, you wake up and the next day, you know, most of them don't have very long half life. So you're not left with, you know, any degree of side effects. And though nootropics are great c- compared to Adderall, as an example, they're just a little, I mean, look, some nootropics, you can get pretty much an Adderall like effect. But oh, yeah. most nootropics, <laughs> yeah. But but most yeah. nootropics are 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 not going to be as strong, but still mm-hmm. very strong. Eighty percent, mm-hmm. you know, eighty five percent as strong, and that's kind of I think that 
you know, that, that gap where that other 15% used consistently is what gets people side effects. The beauty of nootropics yeah. is you know, just a little less potent, but less side effects. And the, the good thing is, like you mentioned, it's a short half-life. So you can basically take it for the time that you want to be super productive for four to right. five hours of that day. And then, you know, do right. the medial task a little bit later in the day. But like Adderall, you know, even a normal release or, or the other dextroamphetamines or, or modafinil or dihexa, for example, right? very mm -hmm. long lasting, you know. And if you already have yeah. sleep issues on testosterone replacement therapy, this will make it infinitely worse, of right. course. Funny, it's like I've used modafinil like for years, but at a very mm. low dose of 50, 50 milligrams per day just yeah, to help with productivity. Yeah, that's a good Great. dose. And then I, at one point, I've like I started doing research regarding fertility, and modafinil is not good for your fertility, uh, clearly. Uh, did not so know so that. I stopped. Yeah, so I, I stopped that. There's quite a lot of scientific literature to support that. So I was like, okay, it's time to get my wife pregnant. No more modafinil. I stopped it one day okay. to the next. I slept maybe 10 hours instead of eight hours for like three or four yeah. days. And, uh. but nothing crazy withdrawal, like you would have from, uh, you know, SSRIs or Adderall, which I, I never had to withdraw from because, you know, act availability in Thailand is, uh, you know, it's basically not available here. So I don't have it, mm. access to it. Um, so, but modafinil is available and I just stopped it cold Turkey and four days of more uh. sleep. And after that, it was fine. So That's that is great. of note. Yeah. yeah. So at least with That's me and a couple of people that I talked to, they had zero withdrawals. Of modafinil. Yeah. I mean, that's and that's common. And again, I mean, compared to some of the other harder dopamine drugs, I mean, that's why modafinil is like, it's still pretty potent and it's definitely yeah. like noticeably yeah. stimulating, uh, you know, and it's in that kind of arena, but there's just a lot less side effects. Yeah. Yeah. And well, what about paracetams? And I've never really dabbled much with those. Like, I saw, so you made a couple of videos about, and there's many different kinds, right? But can you explain right. to us a little bit, like, what is like the best entry level paracetam? And, and then what, what can we expect from that? They all do different things, Steve. They're, they're like, the one thing they all have in common is that they are forcing you to release more brain acetylcholine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that, you know, putting choline into motion is like focus, memory, some cases, verbal fluency. And so they're very useful at, at doing that. So they all kind of do that at some level. Um, some of them are region specific. So like, you know, mm -hmm. anoracetam as an example is just one of mm -hmm. the racetams and that forces you to release more acetylcholine in the hippocampus, right? So that's kind of like okay. memory centric. Whereas paracetam, which is the original racetam, mm -hmm. they're all just drugs that, that affect brain acetylcholine, among other things, with the suffix racetam. Regular paracetam will make you fire choline at a faster rate. It, it, it mm. um, acts as an agonist. It can act as an agonist at the acetylcholine receptor. So it's it's doing something slightly different. And then there's another racetam called phenylparacetam, mm. which you know activates choline signaling and makes you function better. But it also is a mild dopamine reuptake inhibitor, so so ah, it'll make you keep okay. it'll make you keep a little more dopamine. Around. So you're getting this tandem approach of like two neurotransmitters heightened. Um, so that's like a very very potent, you know, very widely mm. used racetam, phenylparacetam. You know, and some of the others are are doing some of the same things um, mm. compared to those. And then there's like one sort of oddball racetam and it's called fasoracetam with an F, with an F mm. fasoracetam. And that stuff make you release a little more choline, but largely it modulates the GABA B system somewhat comparable to phenibut, but not as strong, but still mm. good in a way that relaxes you. Ah, so, okay. So, so, yeah. so could you, yeah. could you go with phenylracetam during the day and the, what is it? Fasoracetam. Paracetam later in the day. <laughs> uh, yeah, you could take phenylparacetam. I think what you're referring to is yeah, phenylparacetam, yeah, which is the dopamine reuptake inhibitor. Um, during the day, get a lot of energy, get a lot of work done, and then if you want to chill things out, you could take fasoracetam at night. Yeah, I mean, many oh, wow. people, clients, friends, ex girlfriends, like I've had take fasoracetam to sleep better. Uh, it, it is useful okay. in those regards. Yeah. So, and if you take that at night and you put one of those um, headsets on with like Spanish or yeah. uh, another language, would you would yeah. you be able to absorb that? 
Uh, maybe. I mean, you're probably <laughs> functioning a little better, dude. I mean, yeah, yeah. There's the there's all week. kinds of stuff. That's funny, dude. There's there's all kinds of stuff you can do with you know manipulating neurotransmitters, and especially in that place, like when you're going to sleep, where I don't know. It turns out you're you're more likely to be programmable, depending on what you're listening to. Then yeah, there's a use right. case for that. Right. Yeah, I heard some people that, that do that kind of stuff, you know, they start traveling a month later and they listen to that stuff when they're asleep and then somehow they're able to listen to the language without spending yeah. any waking hour on it. Dude, <laughs> like, oh, that, that sounds that interesting. So cool. That's so yeah. Cool. So can you take any of these racetams with you per scene A? That sounds to be like a lot of counterproductive or does well, it actually you- enhance each other effect? They can. The, the thing about racetams is like, they're putting choline into motion. Mm. And so, you know, you usually want to have enough choline in the mix. So that's why usually people supplement with a choline precursor mm. and acetylcholine precursor while they're taking racetams. Otherwise, ensure you're getting eggs, beef, fish, anything that has choline in it in right. your uh, in your diet. Like, I mean, I think that's useful. But Hooper's A, as I think you understand because in that video I did yeah. about you about choline, you were referencing uh, Huber Zine and its effect on choline metabolism. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's inhibiting the enzyme that breaks choline down. So you just accumulate a bunch More, of choline. Yeah. yeah. So like that, you know, you can. So that's useful when when taking racetams because the racetams mm-hmm. are putting choline into use. The Huber Zine is giving you more choline, but ultimately, like you need to still be conscious of providing choline usually after you dose like aniracetam and hubrisine because you're going to be putting all this choline into use and so you know you probably deplete the releasable pool to some extent so it would be right. useful to take like um you know maybe some coin the next day or something or even later on that night or just like eat some mm-hmm. foods with eggs but yeah uh, or some stuff with coin in it but yes racetams can stack with hubrisine a because they're kind of complementing each other you just got to be oh, careful okay. on okay. yeah the dosing yeah. as far as Huber's right. DNA is concerned. You know, I don't know what dose is in the product that you were mentioning, but between two, 40 two, two, and yeah, this is 200, I think 200. 200 yeah. Between 40 yeah. and 200 micrograms is always a safe bet. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I remember for myself when I was really overdoing the alpha GPC and the Huber's DNA, then I started getting a little bit of a, the cholinergic side effects. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, I was, and then so that's uh, I've always been very, uh, you know, mindful of not overdoing it. So, like right. one one scoop of Gorilla Mount uh, Respawn has what is it? Uh, Two hundred micrograms Uprazine A, and then four hundred milligrams Alpha GPC. So that's yeah. that feels like a good, you know, complementary stack. But I remember yeah. when I used to do like six hundred mic uh, milligrams Alpha GPC, or maybe even twelve hundred milligrams. And on top of the dietary calling that I would get, so like a bodybuilder diet, yeah. a lot of eggs, a lot of beef. <laughs> so oh, I yeah. would feel a little bit loopy at the end of the day. So yeah. that's why I mentioned that in the video. It's like there's there's a like an optimal dose where you feel like mm-hmm. you have like bliss and you're super productive. And yeah. then there's overdoing it, and then you feel you feel weird. You know? Yeah, you're yeah. basically over overtaxing yeah. the choline the receptors and and they have right. you know it, it's i mean if you if you if you accumulate too much acetylcholine it's ultimately toxic but that's way high doses of that stuff and yeah, it's, yeah you, don't, mean, you could, don't do it very much you couldn't even reach that with a lot of the precursors but ultimately the side effects are are what that is just a mild version of that choline receptor toxicity mm-hmm. which again if, if you're dosing anything below 800 milligrams of alpha GPC, you never run into that problem. Same thing with 200 yeah. micrograms of, uh, of uh, Hooperzine A. You know, you mentioned that like I tend to those things lower and respond mm-hmm. better to those things. And, and I think a lot of it does have to do with the optimization, right? I mean, it, I don't take any anticholinergic drugs that mm-hmm. are messing with choline. And some people do, whether it's mm-hmm. uh, an SSRI or, or whatever they're taking, right? And so like right. they need higher doses of choline and they can tolerate it fine. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas like yeah. with me, uh, I'm eating eggs, I'm off, I, I'm running in the morning, I work out in the morning, like I sleep mm-hmm. good. I just, there's not a whole lot wrong with my physiology because every time there's something wrong, I like have to attack it and figure out what's yeah, going fix on. It, yeah. learn the next, Get rid of this shit. Know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, dude, it just becomes your life at that point, right? And so yeah, right. You know, that's why right. I respond, you know, differently to, or at least in lower doses compared to, you know, what right. you may call a large quantity of people who require higher doses of the stuff. 
Yeah. I think like there's always polypharmacy involved, right? Like for me as a bodybuilder, just, you know, a multitude of different compounds and some of them are nootropic, some are for bodybuilding purposes and, you know, some are for like a mitochondrial support stack. And when you really look at the metabolic pathways, some of them overlap. Like fluvoxamine, for example, is a very potent yeah. cytochrome U450 enzyme inhibitor. So some of wow. the drugs that are metabolized with uh, uh, CYP3A4 and 5, fluvoxamine inhibits. But modafinil wow. induces these cytochrome enzymes. So now you take something that inhibits it and something that um, induces it. Which one right. is going to win? Right? And then some right. of the drugs are going through the pathway. And, you know, like some, like Adderall, for example, is going through CYP2, um, a man, CYP2 something. And the liver enzyme you take, you're talking about? Yeah, yeah these right. are one of some of the, the, the enzymes that uh, break it down, right? And right. then testosterone actually uh, down regulates uh, some of these enzymes that are met metabolizing Adderall, but uh, caffeine no also goes through it. So when you take, um, Testosterone, it, it, some of these enzymes down regulate the expression of these enzymes in the liver. Yeah. And then you yeah. take Adderall or caffeine, and now your sensitivity goes up. Wow. So, this is something that you might experience later down the line that you might even yeah. need to reduce, reduce your dosages further because your yeah. me metabolism changes. So, that's the, interesting shit, man. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm so focused on the neurochem side that I've never even thought about like liver enzymes and yeah. all that. Yeah interacts no, it's, fascinating, it's, dude. Dude, it's it's too much to to learn as an individual right i focused on the metabolic pathways because i used to help people beat the drug test so we know need to know exactly uh, how it's being metabolized where the metabolites end up at to, uh, to make sure that they you know test clean on the day of the competition to represent their country very slick but, yeah very yeah, slick. yeah. guys need to win right so uh -huh. but you know regarding the cognitive stuff like for athletic performance you don't need to be that cognitive you just need killer drive and and you know ability to suffer right but as a businessman yeah. you do, you do need cognitive benefits so there's I, that's why it's interesting to talk to guys like you you're you're so specialized in that one aspect and i'm right. i'm over here but we can always meet in the middle and then, definitely uh, you know, oh yeah fill, fill each other out hey this was a great podcast man uh we should definitely do this again is definitely. there anything uh, anytime you want to say uh anything you want to say before we uh cut it off no, um, just like, it, you know, if some of you guys are thinking about what, what we just talked about, especially on the nootropic side, come to my channel. It's called Cortex Labs. I mean, there's like 1300 free videos, but make sure you only watch the last <laughs> year or two because my, yeah. my ones from five years ago, I cringe at. Um, but, you know, aside those from- Those are the ones that I watch too. I love those, man. It's it's good. Like so straight funny, to the bro. point. Yeah, straight yeah. to the point. And, and I'm going to go stuff. watch all your old videos now. <laughs> oh yeah, you'll, you'll laugh too. You're like, what the hell is wrong with this guy? <laughs> oh man, dude. It's so funny how you evolve and that happens. But, uh, right. you know, aside from that, like there's, there's just, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of Reddit anecdotes on nootropics out there. There's a lot of dose recommendations. My suggestion would always be, if I were to leave you with one thing, it'd be start on your dosing on some of these compounds low because you can always work your way up, right? You know, realize where you can execute the usage of a nootropic or a nootropic stack and get no side effects, but only get benefits. And then like, if you can intensify the effect, then just kind of work your way right. up from there. Right, right. And then you slowly start stacking stuff that makes sense. And and if you find something like what, what I tell people, if you find a stack that really works for you, try to find that in a product and then yeah. use the product because then you don't have to totally. stack and source everything yourself. And you know, there's, right. there's usually discount codes so you can save yourself some money Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. make it a little bit more convenient. Hey guys, you can yeah. find Ryan down below all the YouTube uh, and, and social media links are down below website as well. Uh, I think you also do consultations, right? So if yep. you want some nootropic advice from Ryan, head on over there and uh, man, it was a pleasure to talk to you, man. Absolutely. Dude, awesome. Epic talking Thanks with you, too, man. Video. Yeah. Oh, of for course. Sure. I've been watching your channel for so long. And like I said, there's times when I'm stuck on stuff related to hormone physiology. Go to, mm -hmm. go to Vigorous Steve's channel. Right. <laughs> awesome. That's where I got to go. Awesome. It was a pleasure, man. Hey, it was nice to talk to you and I'll uh, talk to you again soon. Okay. Take you got care. it, brother. See ya. Take care.